The United States of America is bound by shared history to the continent of my birth, Africa. But much of that history has been a source of deep pain and conflict, a reality symbolized by one place in particular. That building over there, the White House here in Washington, D.C., today occupied by an African-American president, but built in part by slaves, Africa's first natural resource to be exploited by America, its people. But now there is something new, two significant developments which may define the United States' relationship with Africa for decades to come. The first is a legacy of the Bush administration, a brand new military command for Africa called AFRICOM. And the second is this man. I have the blood of Africa within me. And my family's own story encompasses both the tragedies and triumphs of the larger African story. In this two-part series, I will be traveling to the United States and through East and West Africa to investigate the US strategy for this great continent. What will AFRICOM mean for Africa? And can President Obama's administration turn US-African relations in a new direction? This is the front line. This is the front line for dealing with any threats to the United States of America. In this program, I look at the genesis of AFRICOM, ask if the US is using it to help gain access to resources, and reveal how it became involved, albeit indirectly, in its first African war. AFRICOM was officially launched on the world in October 2008. I am confident that in the years to come, people will see in Africa that is secure, stable, and develop in ways meaningful to its people and our global society. The new command is charged with carrying out US policy in Africa and training and supporting the United States' military partners on the continent. But it was never going to be easy. America has a lot to live down in Africa and leaders across the continent remember only too well how the CIA wreaked havoc helping to undermine popular governments and prop up warlords and dictators. But for many Africans, there is something more than the United States' history which makes them suspicious of AFRICOM. It is, at its heart, a different kind of command. The focus is on the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, and development. The questions began immediately. Surely diplomacy and development in Africa is the work of diplomats and development workers, not soldiers. U.S. foreign policy led by warriors, essentially, um, is a disastrous scenario. It's clear that you can't have warriors who are also diplomats, warriors who are also humanitarian. Those lines cannot be combined. Yet, on one level, the creation of AFRICOM was simply a reorganization of the US's military command structure, which divided the world into five separate geographical combat commands. But there was an anomaly. Africa, that huge continent at the heart of the world, was shared between three of them. So the creation of a new command dedicated to Africa was, in military terms at least, a logical step. But the US not only failed to sell it to Africa on that basis, they failed to consult Africa at all. Amina Saloum Ali is the African Union's ambassador in Washington. Since this is something new and it has really ramif a great ramification in terms of the, the future of Africa, I think we should have expected that initially there would have been a, a sort of uh, uh, consultations between the US government and African government. It was seen as this is another military imposition to African soil. And it was that which got AFRICOM into most difficulty of all, the apparently unilateral assumption that it would build headquarters in Africa. It was an extraordinary mistake which rang alarm bells across the continent. Ambassador Hank Cohen is one of the United States' most experienced African diplomats and was the State Department's top African expert under George Bush Sr. Well, the, the Africans have always believed in 
what the original concept of non-alignment. We do not belong to any of the great powers. It was partly anti-colonial. You know, we got rid of the colonial powers. We don't want to have new colonial powers come in and take us over. So if Africa comes along and says, we'd like to set up a headquarters there and several sub-headquarters, they suddenly say, hey, wait a second, uh, this bothers us. Are you trying to take us over? And that led to a humiliating climb down for AFRICOM. AFRICOM kind of came out like Athena from the head of Zeus, fully, <laughs> fully grown and ready to go. And then it couldn't find a place to go. Couldn't find a country that it would accept its headquarters. Couldn't find anybody that wanted it. And so with its physical headquarters in Germany and its political masters in Washington, one of AFRICOM's first missions has been to allay the suspicion that surrounds it. America needs to convince its critics that far from representing a militarization of its relations with the continent, AFRICOM actually represents a whole new departure based on the developmental, humanitarian and security needs of Africans. So why has Africa been so skeptical about AFRICOM? In Washington, I asked President Obama's top African diplomat, Ambassador Johnny Carson. I think uh, many uh, Africans saw in it uh, a effort by the uh, U.S. Uh, to use AFRICOM to uh, counter a Chinese presence, uh, to be uh, a, uh, a protector of American energy and oil uh, resources, and finally uh, as an effort to uh, counter uh, rising uh, insurgencies and, and terrorism. So what is the reality? We asked AFRICOM itself, and its commander, General Kip Ward, the highest ranking serving African American in the US military, invited us to accompany him on a mission to Rwanda. Well, I think the thing that we'll see here in Rwanda is an absolutely marvelous, marvelous example of how a nation has come back from the ravages of the genocide. It has created a professional military, a disciplined force, that is also very much understanding of the role that it can play in trying to bring stability and security to the region. The next day, in honor of the general, the Rwandan Defense Force demonstrates its military mettle. And beside him throughout, although not on this occasion talking to the press, is the US ambassador to Rwanda, Stuart Symington. Now, officially, of course, ambassadors working for the US State Department are the focus and conduit for the United States diplomatic relations with the rest of the world. So the question is, who's really in the lead here? The diplomat or the soldier? The State Department or the Pentagon? There are a lot of fears that there's too much of an emphasis on, on the militarization of the relationship between the United States and African countries such as Rwanda. This is only one small portion of the totality of our relationship. Now, when you talk about development, diplomacy, defense, they all have to exist. And the fact that we do a small portion of it then enables these other things to occur. It's perhaps not surprising that General Ward is so anxious to stress the partnership between diplomacy and defense, because in part at least, AFRICOM is a direct product of the fraught relationship between those two competing wings of the US government. To understand that, we have to travel back to the beginning of the millennium, to a battle fought not in the African bush, but the corridors of power in Washington.